As we heard, this year, Buckfast Abbey celebrates its millennium. It was originally a late Anglo-Saxon foundation, established for the Benedictines in 1018. By 1136, the Abbey may well have been languishing, and in that year, it was gifted to the fledgling Savignac congregation by King Stephen. Then, in 1147, along with all other Savignac houses, Buckfast was absorbed into the expanding Cistercian order. After the suppression in 1539, the site was all but abandoned, with only minor elements of the former monastery complex pressed into secular use. As for the early years of the present Buckfast Abbey, the tale is fully in keeping with the twists, turns, hardships and achievements found in some of the more colourful medieval foundation narratives. To begin with, when the refugee community of French Benedictines arrived on the banks of the Dart in 1882, they would have found a small Gothic mansion built around 1806 by the mill owner Samuel Berry. As Abbot Vonia later recalled, the early monks knew next to nothing about the history of the site. The few ruins that were visible were calculated to bewilder. Of the church, there was no trace. Subsequent events were to feature no small element of happenstance. In the first instance, the architect, F.A. Walters, was introduced to the community and remained involved with Buckfast until his death in 1931. This is Walters' area. The next stage in the foundation narrative might easily have been lifted from the folios of a medieval text. Following a hot, dry summer, in November 1883, one of the brothers, said to have been preparing a cabbage patch to the northeast of the Berry Mansion, struck upon a massive foundation. This, we are told, was to serve as the guide for uncovering the medieval archaeology of the site. At any event, inspired by Walters, and guided day to day by Dom Adam Hamilton, the only English speaking member of the community at the time, over the winter of 1883-84, the monks laid bare the footings of the entire Abbey Church and most of the three ranges of domestic buildings surrounding the cloister, or at least what survived of them. At the same time, however, this story has something of a sting in the tale. As it happened, the medieval foundations in all areas were found to be, quote, in excellent condition for rebuilding on. Walters therefore decided, doubtless with the agreement of the community, that the new church and monastery could, should be constructed directly over the footprint of the Cistercian Abbey. These were now to be designed along Cistercian lines, with the whole programme achieved between 1884 and 1938. As a result, of course, the medieval archaeology now lies totally sealed beneath the modern community's great achievement with very little opportunity for us to interrogate the findings made by Walters and Hamilton, or to build them with fresh understanding and scholarship. So, you may ask, how do we move from just the foundations uncovered in the 1880s to a position where we feel brave enough, foolish enough if you like, to offer this bold recreation of the monastic past? Well, this drawing is a collaboration between artist and historian, grounded in knowledge and understanding. Chris Jones Jenkins is one of the best people currently working in this field, and together I'd like to think we've produced something that reflects the current state of knowledge. The fact that we show no portal, um, I was hoping to use no portal, in the west door, um, for example, does not come about through chance. Equally, there, is no, there, there, is a, there are reasons for the number of bays shown in the nave arcades and for the liturgical arrangements reflected in the disposition of the choir stalls. The east end of the church, too, is deliberately shown in a particular form. There's a calculation behind the number of bays depicted in the open arcades around the central cloister and the forms of the chapter house, the monk's dormitory range, the north-south refectory and the west range are all grounded in solid evidence of one kind or another. Turning to the sources that allow for such detail, the obvious the starting point ought to be the records of the 1880s excavations left to us by Frederick Walters. Indeed, his interest in the various archaeological discoveries is not in doubt, and he certainly produced a sequence of plans. 
In this promising um, early interim, for instance, the positive positions of the presbytery peers um, shows, in the um, shows that he was at least thinking about um, the nature of the Cistercian building. You can also be sure of at least one visit to the site by William St. John Hope, secretary of, the, of our society, and the man who emerged as England's foremost late Victorian monastic archaeologist. Walters was himself a fellow in it, and um, Walters was himself elected a fellow in 1886, and I believe it may have been around a decade later that he made the best known find from the Buckfast excavations available for exhibition here in Burlington House. This fine piece of Limoges enamel is a small door, of course, incorporating a keyhole, and presumably formed part of a reliquary, or perhaps, as Marion Campbell suggests in our volume, a tabernacle. Given these obvious antiquarian interests, then, it's rather disappointing to find that Walt has failed to produce any published report of the 1880s archaeological work at Buckfast. In fact, the only printed account, just five pages in length, was written by the Plimpton scholar Joshua Brooking Rowe, and appeared in the Devon County Journal for 1884. Fortunately, this is supplemented by a few precious insights sprinkled through Hamilton's 1906 volume, essentially concerned with the history of the site. In terms of the archaeology, then, I would have to argue that the main contribution to Cistercian studies left to us by Walters is his collection of plans now in the Buckfast Abbey archive. Of particular note, the overall, his overall plan of 1884, modified after further findings in 1886, you'll see the slip of paper added at the top left-hand corner, um, is our principal source of information. Even here, however, the architect made no attempt to phase any of the structures, nor even to offer an overall deck range. Fortunately, there are several other sources which you might turn to for information on the nature of the Cistercian buildings. Buckfast. Not least, we have a number of important early prints and drawings, with the Buck view of 1734, for example, being especially useful in this instance. Then again, we have a small but significant collection of both descriptions and sketches produced by antiquarians and travellers, such as Dean Jeremiah Mills, Miles, I'm never quite sure which, who was at Buckfast in about 1760, or the Reverend John Sweet, who came in 1793. When James Lasky arrived in 1796, he noted, on the northeast side appear the walls and foundations of the Abbey Church and the remains of its tower. A further note, you might remember that a few precious fragments of the medieval monastic complex still survive above ground. The North Gate, for example, was clearly a late 12th century structure featuring groin vaults in the gate passage. And standing near the southwest corner of the Cistercian West Claustral Range, there is the so called Abbot's Tower. This mid to late 15th century structure um, probably formed part of the late medieval Abbot's lodgings. Finally, there is a collection of nearly 140 fragments of carved architectural stonework recovered during the excavations of the 1880s. We were beginning to think that this material we were beginning to think that this material was all but lost. But I'm pleased to say that posing the right question at just the right time led to the rediscovery of the fragments in cargo boxes. They too have much to tell us. Now this evening I cannot cover every last stage by which we assemble this source material into something meaningful, even believable, working within the appropriate architectural and monastic context. The best I can do is perhaps highlight some of the key points, focusing primarily on the Abbey Church. Savigny is unquestionably the place to begin, with its picturesque ruins surviving on the southern border of Monch in southwest Normandy. Savigny was established in 1105 by the hermit preacher St. Vitalis of Mortain, and around a decade later it became a fully conventual abbey. The essential point to grasp here is that Savigny was, for a while at least, the head of a totally independent <coughs> monastic order. Indeed, until 1147, the Savignacs proved extremely popular among the rich and powerful in both Normandy and England. Vitalis's monastic experiment blossomed into a thriving congregation, 
with around 30 abbeys situate, situated on both sides of the English Channel. Half of these were in England and Wales, which is the immediate context in which King Stephen, already a great supporter of the Savignacs, was to, de was to determine a new future for Buckfast. Now, for the architectural historian at least, the principal interest lies in determining the extent to which Savigny's architectural identity was transmitted, if at all, across its wider Anglo-Norman family. This is all the more intriguing when we appreciate that nine of the English and Welsh houses were first-generation daughters of Savigny itself. In other words, they were staffed from the beginning by monks who must have been familiar with the emerging architectural philosophy of, of the mother house. Unfortunately, far too little is known of the primary buildings at Savigny itself, with prints and drawings of the site depicting the secondary church began in the late 12th century. And it's a similar tale across much of Normandy, where buildings survive, they're often later than one might make them later than one might wish. The principal exception to this pattern is Vaudesene, one of Savigny's earliest daughter houses. Here, much of the church still survives, with the east end of particular interest. In fact, there's a remarkable similarity between the early presbytery of Vaudesene and the known ex and, and, the, and, the, and the building known from excavations at Furness Abbey in Cumbria. These two ground plans of the late 1120s or 1130s featured stepped ambulatory east ends, which in itself indicates that the initial architectural identity of the Savignacs might well have been at variance with what we know of the Cistercian approach at the time. Although the Savignacs were obliged to merge with the Cistercians in 1147, no time to go into this this evening, Abbot Serlo was able to negotiate a senior position for his house within the Cistercian hierarchy, and to a greater or lesser degree, the Savignac Abbeys retained their family links. Nevertheless, from 1147 onwards, their future was closely tied to that of the most successful and well-regarded religious order in medieval Europe. The Cistercians were, of course, distinctive in almost every facet of, mon of monastic life, and from the mid-1130s onwards, when they began to build on a larger scale, a degree of similarity emerged in the design of many of their churches. Please, let's not argue about this site tonight. Indeed, we cannot ignore the general architectural austerity found in their buildings, nor the widespread occurrence of the so-called Bernardine Plan, both highlighted here at Fontenay. At the very least, it is possible to identify a distinct architectural aesthetic in White Monk building, barely surprising in an order so fiercely self-conscious of its reformist image in all other areas. To underline this point, we need only look at events which occurred at Furness in the wake of the Savignac merger. The Furness community proved very reluctant to submit to Cistercian authority, with Abbot Peter deposed and a monk from Savigny sent to restore peace and to teach the rebellious monks the observance of the new order. In this context, it's very tempting to see the abandonment of Furness's early Savignac church and its rebuilding along strict Bernardine lines as a concerted campaign to enforce Cistercian observance in architecture as much as spiritual life. So the stepped ambulatory east ends go and the square Bernardine style end is introduced. We even find examples of elaborate chevron moulding from the Savignac building abandoned and used merely as core work hidden from view within the roof space above the new South Transept chapels. Given what I've hinted at with regard to the mid 12th century Savignac and Cistercian building program building programs it seems most unlikely that the plan of Buckfast, uncovered by Walters in 1884-86, represents a single coordinated cam campaign of construction. On the contrary, given the fact that the Savignac community settled here in 1136, it's perfectly possible that a, degree, that a degree of progress was made on the construction of the church even before the merger with the Cistercians in 1147. In terms of what may have happened next, 
and with sweeping generalisation this evening, I offer you Bilbus as a model. Founded from Savigny in 1135, just a year before Buckfast, the ruins of the Shropshire Abbey suggest how rapidly fresh Cistercian influences were to play a part. If anything, pre if any pre-1147 pre um, masonry survives in the existing fabric, it will surely be in the area of the presbytery and transepts. What seems clear, however, is that Bilbus was begun without a tower or a defined crossing, even if the church was probably designed to feature an aisle nave from the outset. Then, no longer than about 1150-60, the whole scheme was revised to include a low tower or belfry after all. As completed, the church featured all the essential hallmarks of the Bernadine plan, with a short square-ended presbytery, Um, transepts with two small eastern chapels, these little things, and an aisle nave of seven bays. The internal liturgical arrangements were set out to accommodate a large body of lay brothers, as well as the choir monks, in two sets of stalls. Similar churches are known from several other Savignac houses, um, quite a few actually, absorbed into, into the Cistercian order in 1147 including Furness, which we've already seen, along with Coggeshall in Essex, and Quar on the Isle of Wight. And in some, I would argue that something along these lines also existed at Bildwas, with my approximate and rather clumsily restored presbytery outline shown here in red. I suggest the main body of the transepts, that's the, this, these areas, um, along with the nave, were retained throughout the life of the medieval abbey. Walters records no external buttresses on the sides of the church, um, nor does the plan offer any indication as to the position of the arcade piers. But in comparison with contemporary Cistercian buildings, including those in the Savignac family, one has to be thinking of perhaps seven or eight bays at most. That's the five bays, the arches running along the length of the walls. At Bildwas, the nave elevations, as at Bildwas, the nave elevations were almost certainly of two stories. There would have been screen walls between the piers, here there are the stubs of the um, Bildwas piers, of the Bildwas walls, and, and the roof of the central vessel was almost certainly of timber, not of stone. At first glance, these Romanesque fragments may not look like much, but they do provide clues as to the appearance of the early church. The two on the right, in particular, seem to represent piers, with, with the possibility that the different colours in the sandstone contributed to a polychrome design in the nave, a feature not uncommon in other great churches in the southwest. A significant pointer as to the initial arrangements at the west front of the church comes from this plan of 1923. Superimposed on his proposals for the present church, Walter shows the foundations of the Cistercian West Front in far more in detail than his 1884-86 drawing. I hope you can see this, it's pale. Um, the paler lines are the, his, his proposal for the new church, and the slightly darker red lines are the, um, the Cistercian church. And you can see that there is a central buttress here, these are in line with the nave arcades, it's a central one. The central one indicates that there could not possibly have been a west doorway. Um, as we see from two other um, British Savignac family churches, this would not have been that unusual. At Bildwas, an arrangement of pri precisely this nature was never altered, whereas at Basingwork in northeast Wales, a modest opening was cut through to one side of the central buttress in the late Middle Ages. So this is in sum in this drawing, so we reconstructed the seven bay nave arcade, no doorway, two sets of choir stalls, screens which I've not had time to say anything about. This, this east end is, 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 is later. Two story elevations, wooden roof of the nave. Turning to the eastern arm of the Abbey Church as it appears in the Walters plan, um, so all of this, all of this area. This cannot belong to a Cistercian building of the mid-12th century. 
Indeed, I suggest that it is an extension to the original plan, and it, that it was probably constructed in the early years of the 13th century. At the root of this proposal, I am, of course, thinking of the step change in the design of Cistercian churches, led by the principal French mother houses of the order, all of which had abandoned their initial presbyteries by the end of the 12th century. Instead, they chose to construct much enlarged eastern arms, with fully developed ambulatories providing space for addition, additional chapels and altars. The new presbytery at St Bernard's Clairvaux is known chiefly from engravings, but it was undoubtedly a potent model. Built about 1148-74, it featured a rounded arcade or hemicycle surrounded by an ambulatory, beyond which was a circuit of nine radiating chapels housed within a polygonal outer wall. Not surprisingly, the as the burial place of the order's greatest saint, the Clairvaux Presbytery was quickly imitated elsewhere. Of particular significance in the Buckfast context is the fact that from about 1173, its mother house at Savigny <coughs> embarked on, on the construction of a new apsidal eastern arm featuring nine radiating chapels, part of a completely new church eventually consecrated in 1220. And to demonstrate the same pattern spread to other houses in the French Savignac family, I showed you this charming 18th century drawing of the now lost church at the Abbey of Bobec. Meanwhile, the second model for these extended Cistercian presbyteries is best illustrated by developments at Cito, the sovereign mother house of the order. Here the scheme is dated to about 1180-90 and was of the so-called rectangular ambulatory form. As completed, the lateral aisles of Cito's new presbytery were continued at right angles around the back of the high altar, with room for rows of square chapels within the bays on each of the three sides. Now, of these two basic models, one might argue that, the, that in the long term, the white monks were always more comfortable building churches with straight-sided with straight eastern arms and these were to prevail across Europe during the later Middle Ages. In the event, it was Savignac Byland that appears to have been the first British house to abandon the ideals of the Bernardine plan. Begun in the 1170s, Byland's impressive church stood at the forefront of early Gothic architecture in the north of England, with the eastern arm of re rectangular ambulatory design, much as at Cito, the presbytery aisles were effectively continued around the eastern end of the building. The same basic model was soon interpreted on a smaller scale, door in Herefordshire, about 1186-1220. Here, however, both the ambulatory aisle and the eastern chapels were housed under a single roof. So this same roof turns and the slope of it is effectively there, and both are contained in two bays in that area. The take-up of the rounded ambulatory form among the British Cistercians was very much in the minority. Surprisingly, indeed, the houses within the Savignac family showed not the slightest interest in the new apse and ambulatory design built at their Norman mother house. Croxton in Staffordshire is sometimes cited, but even here it's been argued that the patron may have been of more of an influence than anything going on at Savigny itself. Back at Buckfast, the specific, uh, the specific reasons for the new construction eludes us, with no, no record of a fire or a natural disaster of any kind. The rebuilding is just as likely to have been motivated. I'm sorry, I might have just. Yes, I'm sorry, I just jumped a couple of slides there. The rebuilding is just as likely to have been motivated by the growing desire throughout the order for additional altar space, perhaps coupled with architectural ambition, either on the part of, the sp of, an, of a specific abbot or of the entire abbey community. As to the layout of the building, it comes as no surprise to find that Buckfast displays a close and obvious relationship to Britain's other rectangular ambulatory designs. So here we have this old... Oh, 
that we have this rectangle, these aisles, in some shape or form, I'm suggesting that the aisle continued around the back of these foundation walls. Um, the inner chapel, the inner transept chapel, which would have been there, the second chapel, is sacrificed to create the new aisle in precisely the way that Walters' present church does the, same, does the same thing. So this represents the outer chapel, um, the outer transept chapel, and this is the sort of thing that would have appeared running along there in the Cistercian building. It's impossible to be sure if the various foundations recorded to the east end of the presbytery were all contemporary. On ba balance, however, however, it's tempting to argue for something along the lines of the pattern found at the door, in which case the presbytery, including the high altar, might have occupied three bays. And you can imagine um, the piers running along here, and three open bays representing um, the presbytery with the high altar at, the, at that end. In which case, the, pres uh, uh, the, one, the ambulatory aisle would then have sat in a lower extension in, um, to the east, occupying the space between the two parallel sets of foundations. A further arcade may have opened towards shallow eastern chapels, or perhaps little more than a row of altars. In our millennial volume, I stick my neck out still further, suggesting that Abbot Nicholas, who ruled from 1205, perhaps through to the early 1220s, was just the sort of character who may have been drawn to the prestige attached to such a new, to such a new building programs. Aside from the rebuilt presbytery, there is a second distinct structure at the east end of the Abbey Church. Even from its footprint, this looks to have been a diff of a different architectural character, and it was surely a later addition to the plan. It was arranged in three bays, defined by buttresses along the lateral walls. The interior must have been vaulted in a single span, and there were doubtless windows in each of the lateral bays, presumably with more extensive glazing scheme in the east gable. Hitherto, if this chapel is mentioned in the literature at all, it suggested it may have been a lady chapel, and there can be no doubt in the devotion of the Cistercians to the Virgin Mary. Yet it was precisely because their churches as a whole were dedicated to the Virgin that the Cistercians did not usually feel the need to build architecturally distinct cha lady chapels. In fact, chapels of any dedication located east of the presbytery seem to have been extremely rare. The only other known British example was uncovered at Stratford Langthorne, which intriguingly was another Savignac house in origin. In this case, the excavators were unaware that the feature has few parallels, but, and they do tentatively identify it as a lady chapel. Given the rarity of such eastern chapels, and the doubts over the dedication of Buckfast, it's of considerable interest to find documentary evidence of a lady chapel at the site in the late 14th century. The monks consented to say a daily collect for Sir James and Thomas Audley in the Mass of St Mary. They further agreed to make and keep in repair two figures of their shields of arms in the glass of the gable of the lady chapel. If we take this reference at face value, the specific um, mention of a gable to the chapel suggests the feature um, had such a freestanding element. Further tantalising hints of the qualities of the chapel may well have emerged from John Allen and Stuart Blaylock's study of the loose architectural stonework. A small group of fragments suggests the construction of an impressive building at Buckfast in the second quarter of the 14th century, with clear links to the Exeter Cathedral workshop. In particular, a distinctive rib fragment, number 34 at the top left, looks very much like those found in a number of vaults built in the southwest around this time, including one at Ottery St. Mary, and all associated with the master mason, William Joy. In addition, several pieces of high quality window tracery, including a possible gable element, would also fit well with the building of the 1340s. We cannot expect conclusive proof, of course, that the Eastern Lady Chapel is by far the most obvious candidate. To conclude on, this ch on the church, I'd just like to say a little more about the architectural fragments. As I've mentioned, these were found in the 1880s, and they were found largely on the floor of the chapter house. Brooking Row tells us they were strewn on the floor, and they are believed to have come from various parts of the abbey. The collection included, he says, pieces of small shafts, bits of carved stone and statuary, often coloured. 
Doubtless, this material is represented by the fine groove of late medieval beer stone fi figure sculpture, which still survives, and which is now being studied by Allen and Bledlock. Several of the pieces may represent devotional figures, with others possibly derived from tomb sculpture. One piece, number 42, the top one there, is clearly a headless torso of a cleric in vestments. Another, number 45, this one I think, and the the th um, shows three figures holding a book which must have belonged to a near life-size figure, probably the saint. Further beer stone fragments are likely to have come from small or medium-sized furnishings within the church. The features represented were undoubtedly of elaborate um, design, though it's difficult to be certain whether we're looking at tomb canopies or perhaps a screen with some form of canopy niches. Allen and Blaylock, Blaylock tentatively suggest that the majority of these collections belong to the 14th century. Now, I've said not, next to nothing about the cloister buildings, and I've no time to say any more, really. I just want to highlight um, three little areas, the cloister, the chapter house, and the monks' refectory. <coughs> um, what I'd say about the, the um, cloister, really, is only that the present cloister mirrors in shape and form the Cistercian building, though I don't think that these, there is any evidence that the Cistercian building ever had enclosed alleys or walks such as we see there. Again, from the new stonework fragments, we have these perfect marble shafts, including pieces of capitals, which would have been assembled in this sort of manner um, at the um, earlier example of Bevo Abbey. Um, and these may have survived, these open arcades may have survived right through to the, um, to the, to the suppression. In the East Range, the most, one of the most significant buildings was the Chapter House, which we see here projecting um, um, eastwards from the um, East Coast Range, and the, camp, the Monk's Dormitory would have been on the upper floor here, their day room at the, at the bottom end, and the Chapter House here. And um, I suggested in the volume that we, have, we are looking at a, a building which was aisled in a single span without any median piers, which um, often occur in Cistercian Chapter Houses. And I've linked this to um, Cleve, um, Bindon, and here at Ford, uh, nearby Ford. Um, and I suggest something like this. And the, sorry, the arrow. And in terms of the um, refectory, um, one area where we certainly have come to disagree with Walters, in the South Range, he shows a refectory aligned on an east-west axis. Now, the Cistercians certainly began this way, but very quickly, and it's a long story again, um, they changed the axis. Instead of running east-west, that's Tintin, a wall from Tintin's earlier refectory, they swung out at right angles to the range in much larger north-south buildings. This is the Tintin example. And hey presto, um, on the Buck version of uh, Climb Up Buck, engraving of Buck Fast, here's the cloister square there, and springing out from the south angle is a, is a building with lancets and a larger um, south window in just the right position for a refractory. And I'm going to have to stop there. This, um, if I can, finally, to return to the starting point, all of this and more is um, summarised both in the new reconstruction drawing and in what is doubtless a vastly overconfident phased ground plan based on Walter's original. But before you tear these apart, please, I commend the Millennium Volume to you for more robust and supporting arguments. Thank you. Thank you, David, and Mr. Vice President, guests and fellows. I crave your attention again for the second part of this evening's paper about the role of the late 19th century recolonisation of the site from 1882. Now, in between, uh, in our volume covered by our fellow Bridget Cherry, is the development of the post-dissolution sites fascinating complex, we can't go into it, but we can hint with the beautiful Turner watercolour of 1826 showing the Abbey House, which David showed us in the uh, glass negative, 
nestling in this wonderfully romantic evocation of the Dart River, the Dart Valley, with um, Dart Moor up above. Interestingly, the watercolour is from a number of uh, Turner tours in the southwest, and in particular sketches of the year 1814. Tourism, romanticism, and the idealisation of the Middle Ages behind Turner's watercolour were to be crucial ingredients in our ongoing story. We will look at the phenomenon of the rebuilt church, the monastery and community, the evolution of the design and the furnishings of the church, and at the roles of architect, abbot, and one monk artist. The site came onto the market in 1882, the eccentric owner announcing his preference to sell it to a Catholic religious order. Thus, the Buckfast Abbey Church, rededicated under the medieval title of St. Mary, came to be reborn and now celebrates its millennium. The completed church once again dominates the site and is at the heart of an economic, social and religious unit not unlike that closed so rudely in 1539. Built of Devon blue limestone with these lovely warm hand, hand hill dressings from Somerset and the roofs now in copper. The west front is a set piece based on Tewkesbury and the tower on Kirkstall. The church is 240 feet long, 73 metres, and the tower rises to 51 feet, 15.5 metres. It has an important set of bells. And the church was to be fully furnished, down to the vestments designed by Walters the architect, as shown here in the enthronement of the fourth abbot of Buckfast in 1959. The vestments I refer to are those of the seated abbot with his back to the altar, and those of his attendants with their backs to us. And of course, the, hero, the heroes of the, the, the architectural side of the story are the architect <coughs> Frederick A. Walters, whose dates are 1849 to 1831, properly dressed with a hat on the right, architect here from 1883 until his death in 1931, and then succeeded by his son Edward John, 1880 to 1947, uh, next to his father. And of course, tourism. You see the uh, wandering tourists of a view of the mid-1930s, with the tower being brought to its completion in 1938. Uh, Walters and the Society of Antiquaries. <coughs> By the 1880s, the Gothic revival begun by Pugin was on a second victory lap in the hands of architects and practitioners such as G.F. Bodley, FSA, and for the Roman Catholics, John Francis Bentley, about to design Westminster <coughs> Cathedral. And one of the, the sponsors, at least of the Catholic side of the Gothic revival at the time, is Everard Green, whose coat of arms I show you, Rouge Dragon and Vice President of the Society of Antiquaries in 1891. Green was one of the sponsors of Walters' election as a fellow in 1885, by the which time, as David had mentioned, the Society had part funded aspects of the archaeology at Buckfast. And Walters' first work on the site was the restoration of the Abbot's Tower, which I show you um, already mentioned by David. Uh, Buckfast has a vast but alas 
uncatalogued collection of architectural drawings with which we all had great fun working during the production of the book. And I show you some of the first works by Walters arriving in the autumn of 1883. And they are, of course, the record drawing of the then derelict Abbot's Tower and the proposal for its restoration. His record drawing of October in 1883 and its restoration in November 1883 show how a Gothic revival architect approached the task in the 1880s, carefully distinguishing between old and new work by the colour codes on the right, but with the aim of restoration to an ideal period. The noted Exeter builder and woodworker, Harry Hems, signs these drawings as contractor. Not only record and proposal drawings, but also presentation drawings were needed, such as this watercolour to convince a prospective donor or patron here at the Buckfast Abbey Restoration Committee. And the proposal is for the building of the south range of the monastery, the first permanent buildings for the monks. The, the role of the Buckfast Abbey Restoration Committee is crucial, and indeed it is they who, in a sense, foist Walters on the slightly incomprehending monks, um, agreeing only to give money if Walters is retained as the architect. And that is, in fact, what happens. This drawing of May 1884 shows the south range of the monastery, with once again the abbot's tower on the right, uh, and was built from 1884, largely paid for by the local Catholic bigwig, Lord Clifford. And who were these monks? They were Benedictines, expelled under French anti-clerical laws from their mother house uh, in, in France, expelled in 1880, 1880, and they arrived here in 1882. These Benedictines were strict contemplatives and did not, unlike the English Benedictines of ample forth and downside, run schools. We see them here in a Corpus Christi procession of about the year 1910, the senior fathers on the extreme right, uh, suitably bearded and Gallic looking. <coughs> As in the Middle Ages, the, the, the monastery was designed, divided into choir monks and lay brothers, recruited in France and southwest Germany. Many came as boys for an education or an apprenticeship. Brother Adam Curl, 1898 to 1978, the propagator of the Buckfast B, retired from this role aged 93 and with an OBE in his pocket. Brother Adam's apostolate to the bees is an example of the economic self-sufficiency aimed for here from the first. The monks had no endowment. When Walters first came to Buckfast in the autumn of 1883, the monks had already built and furnished a temporary church. Some of the decoration of the woodwork was done by monks whom we can name, an example of the self-sufficiency I mentioned. But this sort of bon dieuserie was woefully inadequate by English standards of the Gothic Revival by the 1880s, as Walters must have been painfully aware. But however, note the statue of the Virgin and Child on the left. Because the claim was made, and David has mentioned it, that the lower part of the statue was excavated on the site. From this fragment, and from the figure of the Virgin and Child on the seal of the surrender document, of February 1539, which our fellow John Cherry analyzes in the book. From these two pieces of evidence, Walters projected the rest of the statue as we see it. It was placed on the left in the new church in 1922. 
in this perpendicular style chapel, where Walters therefore suggests the lapse of historic time in the development of his early Gothic church. This combination of happy accident, piety, and the rewriting of history was to characterize the whole Buckfast enterprise. What is his first scheme, um, as you will now understand, was uh, designed without any understanding of the um, archaeology of the site, the scheme of October 1883. <coughs> and then, of course, with, with the, the, um, the vignette on which David has, has been speaking to us, the drawing of um, 1886, described as based on the foundations of the ancient buildings as made in March 1884, that's the vignette information. Uh, the, the, the proposal is now completely different, as you can say, as you can see, the church is uh, to the north of the site, and the, uh, the, the, the closer to the south, and the style is, of course, no longer late decorated or perpendicular, but a sort of normano transitional. And for the sake of our orientation, the abbot's tower is hiding in the uh, bottom left of the drawing. This 1895 drawing shows the development of the transition Norman scheme, such as it was described by Walters in the Builder, for a cruciform church, barrel vaulted in the nave and rib vaulted at the east end. The crossing arch with a band of interlace is distinctly Norman, as is the profile of the crossing arch. At note under the arch that a night stair is provided for the monks to sing matins and lords at 2 a.m. in the morning, as indeed these extremely austere monks did at this stage. And we move on to the development by 1909, when Walters once again publishes in The Builder. A Triforium stage has appeared. Uh, rib vaults have also appeared in the name. And we've moved on to a distinct early Gothic style. The East End has been further elaborated, not quite along the archaeological lines that David hinted at, and the tower heightened. And this characteristically is a postcard for purchase on the site, um, as you can see the Abbey Church when completed. <laughs> Uh, the very important collection of uh, glass negatives at Buckfast is fortunately hand-listed and some of the plates are dated. David gave us the date, I think, for 1906 from the top right of the laying out of the cloister and I speculate a date of about 1910 for the laying out of the East End. You can see the throwing of the first arches of the aisle vault. You can see the crossing, the sanctuary, and the uh, square-ended ambulatory chapels. And of course, the glass negative views are all carefully posed uh, to show the monks at work in the physical reconstruction of the building. Uh, by with the, the break of the First World War, uh, work restarts uh, promptly between 1918 and 1922 when the West Front is paid for by two donors, to whom we will refer, the Schillers, and then the rest, the rest of the nave uh, completed behind the West Front. So I show you monks on the scaffolding, uh, properly aproned monks as, as masons wearing their habits, and the, the gaffer, or formal, perhaps, clerk of works, well, no, not formal, a clerk of works with his cap and his tweeds. And we see um, monks um, grappling with centering, uh, looking down the nave from the position of the crossing, uh, photographs of about 1922. The monk builders and the monk carvers and the provision of all the prime labour for the site are, of course, another crucial example 
of the self-sufficiency aimed for. And uh, this, this um, role of the monk builders, I rather naughtily call it the myth of the monk builders in the book, is encapsulated in this uh, window of 1930 um, of the monks, in fact, building that West Front. Uh, and underneath them is the inscription, uh, loosely translated, uh, the church to the Holy Virgin, destroyed by perfidy, was restored by the faith and labour of the monks. And I've argued in the book that the, 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 the counterweight, as it were, of the, the supervisory role um, of, of Walters as the architect, because, of course, it's from his um, highly complex and technical drawings, uh, presentation drawings, working drawings, uh, scale drawings, full-scale drawings, um, that this work goes ahead. And we have, for example, in the archive, um, full-scale details of architectural detail which has been pricked through uh, by the monks for the carving. So, the church is built without a contract and at no estimated cost uh, by the monk builders um, under the supervision of the architect and occasionally with a clerk of works. The, the glass story at Buckfast is not one of the most important, as you can see. And the church, as we would expect from David's explanation, this, this um, very severe early Gothic with these um, vaults in the aisle supporting the nave, and the view into the sanctuary with its very lavish fitting. The church, as I mentioned, is 270 feet long, and I show you the nave with its side altars, the monk's choir, the crossing, the presbytery, and the sanctuary. So, the, the completion of the church by 1932, the year after uh, Walters died, and we now move on from the architect to the great building abbot and Scarvonier, the other hero of this end of the story. And Scarvonier is the second abbot of Buckfast from 1906 until 1938. An Austro-German, he arrived at Buckfast aged 13 with a church vocation already in mind. His reign spans the foundation of the church, 1907, and its consecration, 1938. Describing himself as a monk, as a building abbot, it was his fundraising which saw the church not only built, but lavishly furnished. And while the archive is silent on his methods and his successes, indeed we know nothing of the costs of this building, the names of the donors, however, are recorded in this lavish Liber Vitae on the left, uh, the book which records the names of the pious donors and which uh, would allow them to receive the merits of the masses said at the altar where this book was housed. This was presented by Vonnier to mark his silver jubilee in 1931, by the German goldsmith Bernard Witter, goldsmith to Arkham Cathedral. The contributors to this book were, in my view, uh, very movingly privileged to add our own names in the book as, as it were, further uh, pious donors to the work. And now the fittings of the church uh, the, by, by Bernard Witter. Uh, the Vissa workshop uh, in Arkham were also goldsmiths to Arkham Cathedral, um, that's to say very high up in uh, German religious and, and uh, conservation culture, and as such they were able to make on the left an authorised casting of the famous font of Hildesheim, circa 1220. Uh, this model was chosen by the donor Henry Schiller, uh, who with his wife appears as a kneeling donor either side of the seated virgin. 
slightly altering, that's to say, the donors of the original. And this is made in the Bernathissa workshop in Arkham from 1928 to 32. The fascinating metalwork story in our book is uh, written by our fellow Marion Campbell. And I think you will agree that the accuracy of the reproduction and the Germanic rigor of this culture is really something quite foreign to the whimsy of English church art of the period. And the greatest work of, of, of this culture in the church is, of course, the Golden Altar, of which Walters makes this drawing, proposal drawing in 1928, proposing, that is, that this be built up, larded over his existing altar of 1922. And gold means gold. Um, I show you the altar as it was presented between 1933 and 1965. As Mary mentions, this is one of the great works of interwar, interwar, interwar church art. She goes further, by far the most ambitious and lavish to be seen in any English cathedral church. The other claim for it, of course, is that it claims to be on the site of the high altar of the medieval building. Uh, the sources of the golden altar are clearly chosen by Abbot Vonnier. He saw the, the Mass of St. Gregory here at Burlington House in 1927. He's only entered the National Gallery in 1933. And then in 1928, he saw the Koblenz altar, the Golden Altar of Koblenz at the Musée de Cluny in Paris. And we see the, uh, the red table uh, on the workbench of the Visser workshop, where 12 craftsmen spent two years making it between 1930 and 1932. Um, the, the altar as completed is slightly uh, um, improved by the Visser workshop, who add the uh, bas reliefs of the donors and other detail to that actually rather dull drawing by Walters in 1928. And the Cosmati floor um, round the repositioned altars, repositioned altar uh, was only completed last year. And to conclude with a final aspect of Buckfast's self-sufficiency, the work of the uh, famous Don Charles Norris. Uh, I show you the uh, crossing ceiling that he painted, egg tempera on board. I show you four of its nine panels, 1938 to 39. Uh, Norris was a pupil of Professor Tristram, who, a Catholic convert, spent a lot of time at Buckfast and was clearly um, very close to its then architectural and liturgical culture the painting of the crossing ceiling, and then after the war, uh, uh, Norris comes back from his war service and continues more of the Cosmati floors, but hint, hint, by 1954 on the right, um, the, the floor of the Lady Altar, you can see that he's moving in another direction. Our contributor Robert Proctor has characterised Norris's work as modern medievalism. Uh, he began traditional stained glass making at Buckfast in the 1930s with his two assistants. But by 1965, as you can see, he's moved on to the Dal de Verre technique of randomly cut bottle glass um, set in concrete frames. As we can see in this window of 1965 to the Blessed Sacrament Chapel. Uh, this building was given to the Plymouth architect Paul Pern and built from 1962 to 66. Uh, this is the first time the Walters practice has passed over in 80 years of service to the community. And 1962 is also the year which saw the opening of the Second Vatican Council. Uh, and to conclude, uh, Mr. Vice President, uh, fellows and guests, uh, with Vonnier and his uh, memorial plaque of 1951. <coughs> Vonnier, our building abbot, was a great believer in divine providence. 
it was, it was a kind providence which led the young architect Walters here in the summer of 1883, he tells us. It was a kind providence which saved Abbot Vonnier from drowning in the Mediterranean in 1906. We see him looking up to the Blessed Mother, who appears in the top left of the clock. Uh, she is blessing him uh, amidst the scene of the, the sinking of the ship in which his confrere, the first abbot of Buckfast, drowns. We see um, in this sort of uh, um, tree of Jesse between himself and the Virgin, we see the monks going about uh, their great task of building the church. And we also see, uh, just above his head, a visiting bishop uh, demanding admission to the church. This visiting bishop is surely um, Cardinal Bourne of Westminster, seen on his knees, being admitted to consecrate the church in 1932, by Vonnier in one of the Walters designed vestments. 1932 is the year after uh, Walters' death. It's six years before Vonnier's death and is the point at which we conclude our story. Architect and abbot had truly made a recreation of the monastic past, but for the sake of a monastic present and indeed a monastic future. Thank you.